The hardy animals found living north of the Arctic Circle live in a constant dance with death, with a host of adaptations that help them battle the lethally cold temperatures, creating more body heat hibernating and generally blocking the cold from getting into the body seem like the obvious approaches to survive such cold climates. Approaches taken by the large, often furry animals you normally think of when you think of the Arctic. But there's one animal that seems to defy the logic that applies to most other cold weather animals. An animal that almost certainly does not come to mind when thinking of the frost-covered tundra. It's the only amphibian found north of the Arctic Circle. It's body wet and cold-blooded. And if you came across it in the wintertime, you would undoubtedly think you had found a very dead frog. It's body frozen solid, eyes glazed over, motionless. But if you waited until warmer conditions, you would see that frozen frog thaw out, gasp for air, and bounce right back to life. The wood frog doesn't survive in icy climates by resisting the cold, but by embracing it. It freezes and thaws with the environment, with up to 70% of its body water freezing with every cold snap. This is definitely a handy superpower for the frog. But when it was discovered, scientists immediately saw the bigger story. Utilizing these deep freeze abilities could mean a longer shelf life for human organs, a quest that has been out of reach since the very first organ transplants. Human organs outside the body don't last very long, and when lives are hanging in the balance, even a few extra hours could make all the difference. So how does the wood frog emerge from its frozen state completely unharmed? What lessons can animals like this teach us? And is this ability something we can harness for ourselves? The wood frog is found across the forests of North America, from the Southern Appalachian Mountains up to the tree line above the Arctic Circle in places that freeze and freeze hard. When winter starts to take hold, the frogs take shelter in the leaf litter of the forest floor. They assume a crouched position with the limbs drawn in close to the body and their head lowered. This is the water holding position and helps to reduce the amount of water lost to evaporation over what could be months of being frozen. Ice formation begins in the extremities, then spreads throughout the entire body cavity surrounding the abdominal organs. Eventually, as much as 70% of the frog's body water is frozen and vital signs completely stop. Normally, ice formation like this should shred tissue, the crystals physically ripping cells apart. Freezing also normally wrecks cells by affecting the flow of fluids into and out of them. Before ice forms inside cells, it forms in the spaces between them, which reduces the volume of liquid there. This increases the concentration of dissolved salts and other ions, which causes water to rush out from the cells to compensate, causing them to shrivel and die, all of this leading to a frosty demise. So to avoid this fate, the wood frog's body carefully orchestrates the entire process to avoid ice crystallization and dehydration in vital parts of the body. During the course of freezing, they change over their metabolism, they reorganize themselves, they're not damaged by the physical ice, they're not damaged by the anoxia, they're not damaged by the dehydration. To learn more about how the wood frog can survive such an ordeal, I talked to Dr. Ken Story, professor of biochemistry and wood frog expert at Carleton University. So what happens when a frog is wet and hopping around, yay, and it goes below zero, ice starts to penetrate into the frog. So the frog can't generate heat itself. It's a cold-blooded animal. It's a poikly frog. And so ice begins to push into the frog. This ice goes down veins and arteries, pushing blood ahead of it. So eventually, if you take a stone frozen frog and you cut off its legs and its arms, which is cruel, they have no blood. The blood has all been pushed into the center of the frog, where it's a huge lump of blood that then freezes solid. So frogs are, are blood, huge amounts of blood with large amounts of glucose, 400 millimolar glucose in the middle of them. This glucose acts as a protective molecule known as a cryoprotectant. Ice crystals are only made of pure water, but the temperature at which they start to form depends on what else is in the solution. Anything suspended in water interferes with water's ability to form the hexagonal latticework of ice crystals. Cryoprotectants are molecules, such as alcohols or sugars, 
that animals can use to lower water's freezing temperature inside their bodies, essentially a biological antifreeze. If I gave you a frozen frog, whoa, you would thaw it out, you would taste it, and it would taste sweet. You can measure the glucose of a frog by using a diabetes meter. I don't know if you're diabetic, but you just take a little test strip, dip it in the frog, and then it says, oh my God, you're dead, go and see your doctor immediately. Because your blood glucose should be four, and the blood glucose you measure out of the frog is 400. Once the frog's body senses that the temperature is near freezing, the frog's liver begins to dump massive amounts of glucose into its bloodstream. Then, glycerol, an alcohol, and more glucose starts to be packed into the frog's cells to prevent ice from forming there, and to prevent any drastic loss in volume due to the dehydrating effects of ice formation. At the same time, water begins to move out of the vital organ cells and pools in the extracellular space. Ice nucleating proteins trigger the ice to freeze in these specific places, in sheets between the skin and muscle layers, in small spaces such as the lens of the eye or the ventricles of the brain, everywhere except the critical organs and cells. It can survive this period of no circulation by reducing the metabolic needs of cells, so they don't need much, if any, nutrients and oxygen. And then spring comes, the frog thaws, and all of its organs and bodily functions are restored nearly instantly. And surprisingly, the wood frog doesn't just withstand the cold, but actually depends on it. They're adapted to being frozen. If you take a wood frog and you keep it in the lab and you don't freeze it, it dies. It just uses up all of its fuel. It uses up all of its muscle. It uses up all of its fat. It uses up all of its glycogen and it dies. And even though frogs are amphibians and humans are mammals, we have all of the same major organs. So if a frog can freeze itself completely solid, can we? Is there a way we can recreate this ability, freezing organs and bringing them back to life? In the big picture of history, organ transplants are a relatively recent thing. It wasn't until 1954 that the first human organ transplant was successfully completed a kidney transplanted from one identical twin brother to the other. In 1967, the first liver and the first heart were transplanted, and the era of organ transplants had begun. In the US, there are over 100,000 people on a waiting list to receive an organ transplant, but only around 40,000 transplants are performed each year. 17 people die per day waiting for an organ that never came. Much of this is due to a challenging supply network constricted by the inherent lifespan of organs once they've been removed from the body. With the standard cooling methods, a liver or pancreas can survive for 12 hours outside the body, a heart for only six. When an organ is taken out, it's a race against the clock as cells start dying from a lack of nutrients and oxygen. But cooling them slows this process. It reduces the metabolism of the cells, so they need far less oxygen and nutrients than they would normally. So the idea of freezing organs to slow this process even further, making the organs last even longer, became an immediate goal for doctors. Shortly after the first liver transplant, researchers attempted the first frozen preservation of livers. Using glycerol as a cryoprotectant, they froze canine livers at negative 20 degrees Celsius for periods between 24 hours to two weeks. But when the livers were then transplanted into healthy recipients, the animals only survived for a few hours. The livers had suffered serious damage to their cells, most notably to their blood vessels. Years later, researchers tried again, this time armed with more knowledge of freeze-tolerant animals like the wood frog. Mimicking how the wood frog undergoes freezing in nature, researchers infused rat livers with glycerol and brought the temperature down to just negative three degrees Celsius and did so slowly, mirroring what happens to the frogs in the wild. When these livers were transplanted back into the original donors, they did produce bile, and one animal even lived for five days. But sadly, none of the animals ultimately survived. After decades of work in this field, researchers are coming to the conclusion that ice is just too damaging to tissues, even in the presence of cryoprotectants. The frogs are able to withstand such freezing due to an amalgamation of multiple adaptive strategies. 
anoxia tolerance, dehydration tolerance, metabolic rate suppression, huge amounts of cryoprotectants, targeted ice nucleating proteins, we will struggle for a long time to recreate all of these elements working in perfect unison inside organs, each with different sizes, metabolic requirements, and cell types. I asked Dr. Story if he thinks it will ever be possible to mimic the frozen frog's ability in organ preservation. If we put in time, energy, and money on frozen frogs, learned everything, and then froze human organs, yes, of course it would be possible, but it's not going to be done because it's not necessary. If you discover that there are lemurs that are actually primates, hi, and they can hibernate perfectly, you don't have to freeze a human. You don't have to freeze an organ. You have to turn off their metabolism like a freaking lemur and keep it warm. Dr. Story argues that perhaps looking at freeze tolerance was never the right place to look. If the goal of freezing is simply to reduce the cellular needs of organs, maybe there's a way to achieve this without the freeze. When we think of hibernating animals, we often think of cold weather animals like ground squirrels. But the metabolic rate suppression that characterizes winter hibernation is not actually an adaptation to survive the cold, but to survive periods of drought and periods with no food. Desert animals go through a nearly identical process called estivation. And this then raises the obvious question. If freezing temperatures aren't required for metabolic rate suppression, can we bypass the ice altogether? Can we simply find a way to shut off the metabolism of organs to allow them to last longer? This is the new line of thinking that Ken's story and his lab are investigating. We discovered that primates, primates, little tiny monkeys, look, oh, called lemurs, they hibernate and turn off their metabolism completely, but they're not cold. They're warm and adorable. So then we said, look, why cool down a human? Why cool down a human organ? Why freeze a human organ? Why not just do what a lemur does? The gray mouse lemur is the particular animal model that the Story Lab is currently researching. They are one of a few primate species that have recently been discovered to hibernate, and they do so in warm weather. Every hibernator you know of hibernates in the cold. Oh my God, the bears, the ground squirrels, the bulls, the mice. Lemurs hibernate in Madagascar. It has never been cold in Madagascar for 60 million years, but Madagascar has two sides. The two sides are summer and winter, but they're wet and dry, dry and wet, wet and dry. So the lemurs run out of food for six months of the year, so they lower their metabolic rate. And as primates, they are the closest relatives to humans that hibernate making them the best models for identifying and applying the mechanism of metabolic rate suppression to human needs. The Story Lab is now focusing on understanding the biochemistry involved in warm-bodied metabolic rate suppression. When a lemur finally turns off its metabolism, its body temperature goes down from your body temperature, 37, down to 35. That's not cold. That's warm. They turn off their metabolism with known molecular mechanisms known because we study them. They turn it off with microRNA. They turn it off by taking message RNAs and putting them in prison. So they develop parts of their cells, which are prisons for mRNA, so they can't make any proteins. They do it by phosphorylating and turning off metabolic pathways and reorganizing transcription and translation. And they turn it off by reaching into the nucleus and making certain DNA can't be developed any further. And while complicated, applying these genetic mechanisms to human organ transplants could very well be the thing that saves tens of thousands of lives every year. The animal kingdom has answers to some of our biggest problems hidden within countless species. We just need to ask the right questions. Talking with Dr. Story was definitely the highlight of my week for some obvious reasons. Yes, watch this. Oh, look at this. Yay, watch this. Or my personal thing would be just to put up pictures of Brad Pitt in Fight Club. And because talking with experts like this gives a whole new perspective to the story I'm trying to tell. Every science story is driven because of the people behind it, the ones in the lab or in the field, asking the complicated questions. 
And these human stories, to me, are just as fascinating as the science ones. And this is why we decided to start a podcast to explore just this. Modulus, hosted by me and Brian from Real Engineering, is a podcast about the people behind the scientific stories we tell you here on YouTube. We talk to the scientists who are on the cutting edge of research and the people who are affected by the topics we discuss. The second episode of Modulus launched yesterday. It's an episode where I talk to two pioneers of the ocean, some of the world's first saturation divers. They discuss the physiological and psychological effects of living at the bottom of the ocean for weeks at a time. They're two of the most interesting people I've ever had the chance to talk to, and their stories will give you insight to a whole world that exists at the bottom of the ocean. This episode of Modulus launched yesterday on Nebula, the streaming platform made by me and several other educational YouTube content creators. It's a place to watch and listen to our videos and podcasts ad-free, along with original content that's not available anywhere else, like the Real Engineering series The Logistics of D-Day, or Tom Scott's game show Money. We can take more risks on Nebula, where we don't have to worry about the YouTube algorithm. There is so much original content there, with more being added all the time. And to make it even better, Nebula has partnered with CuriosityStream, the streaming platform with thousands of high-budget, high-quality documentaries. There are loads of documentaries about extraordinary animal behavior, like this one, called Nature's Weirdest Events, made by the BBC. It explores a parasite that can use mind control on a snail in order to reproduce, the massive amounts of slime made by a very strange fish, or the incredible architectural structures made by huge ant colonies. It's a fun 50-minute documentary with several of these wild animal stories. If you've hesitated before to get CuriosityStream and never quite pulled the trigger, now is definitely the time to do it. For a very limited time, CuriosityStream is still offering 41% off their annual plans, making a yearly subscription just $11.79. That's less than a dollar per month. There's only a day or so left on this deal, so get it while it's hot. So by signing up at curiositystream.com slash real science, you'll get a subscription to CuriosityStream and a subscription to Nebula for just $11.79 for the entire year. Signing up is also the best way to support this channel and all of your favorite educational content creators. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon are below.